Food for Work, with special guest Senator George McGovern from the state of South Dakota. Here now to do the questioning is Ken Stofferin, director of the National Farmers Organization Field Staff Department. Our guest today is United States Senator George McGovern of South Dakota. And aside from having a distinguished career in educating, education, he served as the, in the U.S. House of Representatives in 1957 to 1961, Special Assistant to the President and Director of Food for Peace, 1961 to 1962. He was elected United States Senator from South Dakota in 1962. And he's well known over the nation as a statesman of agriculture and author of important farm legislation and a longtime champion of the cause of the nation's farmers. Senator McGovern is involved in the current election campaign, but who is also involved in matters of importance to agriculture apart from politics, about which we want to visit with him today. Senator McGovern, we welcome you to U.S. Farm Report. It's a pleasure to be with you, Ken. You were recently elected the chairman of a new Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs. I wonder if you would give us some of the background of that committee, what it is, what its job is, and what its meaning might be to the farmers. Well, Ken, the, uh, the major function of the committee uh, is to discover, first of all, how much hunger and malnutrition there is in the United States. I think it's very hard for uh, most of us living here in the agricultural heartland of America uh, to believe that there are many Americans uh, who go to bed hungry every night. After all, we live in the most uh, prosperous and affluent society on the face of the earth. There is plenty of food in this country. And I think it's hard for us to understand that in almost every part of the country, there are considerable numbers of people uh, who are hungry, who simply don't have enough to eat, or if they have enough to eat, it may be the wrong kinds of food. If it's not the wrong kinds of food, it may be that they're suffering from uh, illnesses of one kind of another or another that make it difficult for their, them to assimilate their uh, food and to build uh, healthy uh, uh, bodies. So the purpose of our committee is to locate the sources of hunger uh, in the United States, then to take a look at the food distribution programs that are now in operation and to see what we can do to improve uh, the effort that I think the American people want to make to see that every single citizen in this country has a healthy, adequate diet. Now, if we do that, that's going to have a very significant impact on our agricultural economy because to bring the level of diets in this country up to a fair standard for every American would involve an increase of one and a half billion dollars in the sale of agricultural produce. And as you know, that would have a very uh, definite impact on the agricultural economy. It would mean that we could increase production without driving down prices because we'd have an outlet uh, for that uh, additional uh, produce. The uh, committee recently investigating this subject under the uh, leadership of Senator Clark of Pennsylvania has given us a lot of information that we need. The purpose of my select committee now of some 13 senators is to go out into various parts of the country and to get the rest of the picture filled in and then we'll be in a position to make recommendations as to how we can eliminate hunger and dietary deficiencies in the United States. It sounds like it could have a very important impact then. Uh, as I recall, uh, speaking of diets, uh, didn't the Department of Agriculture recently issue a report on family diets back in 1965? Yes, uh, uh, USDA made such a study, but it was a very limited one. It was based on a study of some uh, 7,500 families that were picked in various parts of the uh, country. And it did give us some uh, valuable uh, information as a starting point. I don't think it's anything like a thoroughgoing analysis of the problem of malnutrition and hunger in the United States. But they did find that there's a very sharp and painful correlation between low income and bad diets. For example, of these 7,500 families that were studied in the sample by the Department of Agriculture, of those families, 
with an income of $3,000 a year or less, 36% of them were suffering from bad diets. They were suffering from malnutrition. They were suffering from anemia. They were suffering from aggravated childhood diseases that were made worse uh, because of the lack of good food and balanced diets. I might just say, Ken, that when I was uh, directing the uh, Food for Peace program for the late President Kennedy some seven or eight years ago, uh, one of the first places I visited was in northeast Brazil. And as you know, that's an area of great neglect and poverty and hunger. We went into a little village in February of 1961 uh, where there was a smallpox uh, ep epidemic. Uh, going on. And children were dying like flies, just dying in front of our eyes. We were in one village where two children, I mean one hut where two children had died in that family the day before. There were two other children lying with their heads uh, in the lap of the mother who was sitting on the floor of this little hut. They were eating their noon uh, day meal, which consisted of kind of a ground uh, manioka uh, powder. It was almost as though we would grind up uh, dried uh, turnips or something of that kind. That's about all they had to eat. And I asked the uh, young doctor, a uh, Brazilian doctor who was with me, why so many children were dying from smallpox. I said, we have youngsters with smallpox in the United States, but very few of them die from it. Well, he said, it's because of malnutrition. <coughs> he said, in this part of the world, if a youngster gets a bad cold or if he gets the flu, or if he gets chicken pox, he's apt to die from it uh, because of his weakened condition. Now, to a lesser extent, the same thing exists among poor families in the United States who do not have balanced diets or who do not have enough to eat. At the present time, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare is conducting a larger study. They're going into five states, and they're going to survey 8,000 people in each state uh, to try to find out to what extent malnutrition is a problem in the United States, and I hope our committee can build on that study and that we can make some further studies of our own, and on that basis we'll be in a better position to make recommendations. Well, it sounds very important. Now, Senator, uh, there's some curiosity about how you happen to be chosen chairman of this select committee. Uh, I know the Senate follows the seniority rule pretty closely, and, and you're still in your first term in the Senate. Well, I, I am still in my uh, first term. I might say I hope I'll get a second one. We'll find that out in, uh, in November. Uh, I was selected to be the uh, chairman of this new committee in large part because I was the author of the resolution that created the committee. I got some 40 senators, Republicans and Democrats, and this is a bipartisan effort. Uh, hunger knows no political party. We're not interested in playing politics with the problems of hunger in the United States or with the problems of agriculture. This is too serious a matter to approach on narrow uh, party lines. So I insisted in setting up this committee that we have senators uh, from both parties uh, represented. And we got 40 of them to serve as co-sponsors of the resolution. I'm proud to say that that resolution went through the Senate unanimously. We didn't have a single vote against it from either Republicans or Democrats. And on that basis, we selected five senators from the Committee on Agriculture, on which I've served from the first day I was in the Senate. We've selected five from the Committee on Labor and Public Welfare, and three from the Senate Committee at Large, that is, from the Senate at Large. <coughs> Excuse me. And those 13 senators uh, met about three weeks ago and named me as the chairman of this uh, special committee. Uh, that was based, as I say, on the fact that I was the author of the resolution creating the committee. In addition to that, though, I have been in the Senate now for nearly uh, six years. I want to say very frankly that uh, even in that short uh, length of time, I've become the chairman of uh, one subcommittee on the Interior Committee, which deals with the problems of resource uh, development, problems of Indians and others that are, are of concern to our state. I expect soon to be named as the subcommittee uh, chairman of one of our committees on the Agricultural Committee, and if it should be that the uh, people of South Dakota return me for another term in the Senate, the chances are in the next two or three years I will become chairman 
of the full committee uh, on uh, agriculture. I'm looking forward to that because I think that agriculture is our number one concern here in South Dakota, and I want to be around to do what I can to continue the fight for better farm prices. I'm not satisfied with the situation in agriculture today, and I want to do what I can as a member of the Senate to correct that situation. Well, I know, Senator, from our experience in uh, dealing with uh, legislation in Washington, D.C., I know that the Committee of Agriculture is very, very important. Uh, in addition to this uh, new select committee, uh, there are a number of agencies involved in food programs, aren't there? There are, and this is, uh, this is one of the problems, Ken, that nobody really knows where the responsibility is for dealing with the problems of hunger and malnutrition in the United States. The responsibility uh, is divided among five or six different agencies of the government, and no one has a clear mandate, either from the Congress or from the American people, to deal with the problems of hunger. In other words, there's no place in the United States government, either in congressional committees or in the executive branch of the government, where one can say that man or that agency or that committee is the one that is responsible for ending hunger in the United States. Now, the Department of Agriculture has a piece of the action. After all, they control the surplus agricultural commodities, but they've never been given a mandate to end hunger in the United States. What they have been told to do is to take some of the surpluses off the market and put them in storage. Now, on a kind of a hit or miss basis, they have taken the liberty with instructions from Congress to use some of those commodities in school lunch programs, in food stamp programs, in the school milk program. But they do that not as a major part of their responsibility, but simply as a byproduct of the fact that they own a certain amount of surpluses. They do not have a clear legislative mandate to purchase on the open market whatever is needed to end hunger in the United States. The Department of Health, Education, and Welfare is involved in some of our food distribution programs. The Office of Economic Opportunity is involved in some of our food distribution programs. The Indian Bureau is involved. Now, what we propose to do with this new select committee is to find out the areas of duplication to find out where the inefficiency is, to try to center responsibility in some one agency of the government so that we can pinpoint the uh, obligations for ending hunger in the United States. If you want to confuse the situation, just give about five or six different agencies the responsibility for distributing food and put no one in charge, and you'll have the kind of chaos uh, that we have today. One of the things I learned when I took over the uh, Food for Peace program in 1961 is that no one agency uh, had the responsibility for that program. The State Department had part of it. The Foreign Aid Agency had part of it. The Treasury Department had part of it. The Department of Agriculture had part of it, but nobody was in charge. And the reason President Kennedy brought me over to the White House and set me up uh, in an office just about 50 yards away from his was to make sure that there was one man somewhere in this government who was looking at the whole range of international hunger problems and trying to focus the agencies of the United States government in one direction so that we could eliminate hunger abroad. Now we need to do the same thing here at home. We need to find out where the areas of neglect are, where the areas of duplication are, where the inefficiency and the waste is, in these various food distribution programs, and then we need to come back to the Congress four or five months down the road with a very clear recommendation of what can be done about the problem. That's the purpose of this select committee that I've been named the chair. I'm going to have to take uh, one or two days away from my own election campaign here in South Dakota in order to get the committee staff formed and to get the committee functioning, but most of the work will be done after November and in the period uh, leading up uh, to June 30th of 1969. But it is important that we get on with this work. I regard it as a matter of utmost significance. 
I'm sure that many people will agree with that, Senator. And as I understand it, uh, the new committee then will uh, certainly attempt to unravel all the distribution problems. There's another matter of concern. Uh, many people feel that they're getting sort of a professional uh, welfare type of people who are indolent and just live on welfare to avoid work. Uh, they make no real effort to help themselves. Now, is this a problem? Well, it is a problem. Uh, I don't think the average uh, uh, citizen uh, enjoys particularly living on a dole. There's something uh, uh, demeaning about it. Uh, the average person who has health and strength and energy and who cannot find a job, I think down inside, he resents it when he and his family have to live on a straight uh, handout. As I say, there's something uh, uh, demeaning and undignified about it, and I would hope that through our food distribution programs, we would not try to build in a system of a permanent dole, but that we would establish a ladder in which through improved health and improved diets, we help needy families get to the first rung of that ladder. I would hope that some of these food distribution programs could be actually related to work programs in which uh, food would be uh, made available to needy people in return for which they would agree to do a certain amount of public service work, perhaps in the parks, in the forests, in the streets, uh, in, in the cities, out in the rural areas, conservation projects that would help lend some dignity to this effort uh, to end uh, hunger in the United States. And here again, if I can borrow on my experience in the Food for Peace program, I discovered that the most successful food distribution programs we had abroad were not the straight food handout programs, but they were the programs where we paid people in the form of flour, cornmeal, and milk powder, and soybean oil, and other edible products in return for work that they would do in building schools, in building hospitals, in building sanitation systems, and doing all kinds of things that make for a better life for themselves and their families. So when we talk about an effort to end hunger and to get at the problems of disease and bad housing in this country, we're not talking about a permanent dole. We're talking about extending a helping hand to people who are willing to help themselves. And I fully expect that the recommendations of our committee will underscore the need for self-help for self-initiative, for self-improvement, and the government's role be, will be one of trying to stimulate greater effort on the part of our needy families. Well, getting back to agriculture, Senator, you said that there was an estimate that it would require approximately one and one half billion dollars more of the farm products uh, to assure everyone in, in this country an adequate diet. Uh, what does that mean in terms of the current farm situation? Well, of course, uh, Ken, when we talk about uh, adding one and a half billion dollars to uh, agricultural sales, uh, we need to keep that in, in perspective. One and a half billion dollars uh, sounds like a lot of money, but that's not going to cure the problems of agriculture. You know that. We've got to find some way of adding at least five or six billion dollars to the net income, not to the gross sales, but at least five or six billion dollars uh, uh, to the net income of our family-type farmers if we expect to stabilize this economy out here in uh, rural America. And I want to applaud the efforts of you and your colleagues to try to raise farm prices. I hope our friends in the cities will understand that it's in their interest to save the independent family farm operator and not have agriculture taken over by uh, big corporate interests that are trying to use it for tax dodging purposes that don't care about uh, farm prices as long as they can deduct their losses from income they're making in the cities. But I do think that the work of our committee in recommending an end to hunger in the United States and adding one and a half billion dollars to the sales of our farm producers will make a substantial contribution. What drives down farm prices are surpluses that hang over the market at a time when farmers do not have the bargaining power that other segments of our economy do. 
when we buy an industrial item, we know that we're buying it from a group that has the bargaining power to set the price on that commodity. But the farmer, with a surplus hanging over the market, is powerless without some kind of organization or some kind of bargaining power to protect him in an economy that's a bargaining economy, where everybody else has the strength and the muscle to protect themselves except the unorganized farmer. Now, our committee, if we do the job that we ought to do, and if the Congress follows through with programs designed to see that no American goes hungry in this great country, we can help eliminate some of those farm surpluses, not all of them. I don't want to kid anybody into thinking that this is a complete answer to the farm problem, but it is one step up the ladder towards farm justice and towards a greater degree of prosperity for the American farmer, and this is the direction that I hope we're going to move. I remember some years ago, <clears throat> Ken, that the most senior Republican member of the Senate, who's an old friend of mine, Senator uh, George Aiken of Vermont, he said that we can do more with the agricultural produce of this country to advance the cause of peace and freedom in our own country and in countries beyond the sea than we can do with military hardware. And this is the reason. He said that the thing that drives people to despair, that produces disorder and misery and lawlessness in our cities in this country is in many cases the problems of poverty and hunger and ill health and bad education, the lack of recreational opportunities that finally bring people to the point where they're willing to go out into the streets where they almost lose faith uh, in their government. Now, if we can harness the great productive power of American agriculture and put it to work as a tool to end hunger not only in our own country, but in other parts of the world, I expect for a tiny fraction of what we're now spending on the war in Vietnam, trying to stop the tide of, of communism, that as Senator Aiken has said, we could do more to dry up the swamp lands of hunger in which communism breeds with American food than we can do by shipping any amount of American tanks and airplanes and American soldiers into these areas of conflict and trouble uh, the world around. So I think what we're talking about here is something that not only will strengthen uh, the agricultural economy here in the United States, not only something that will stimulate the cash registers up and down the main streets of South Dakota and Iowa and Nebraska and these other great uh, farm states, but what we're talking about is a life-giving tool that will help lay the basis for a more orderly and a more peaceful and a happier society for our own people here in the United States. And we're also talking about a valuable foreign policy tool that will help stem the appeal of communism to desperate people abroad, that will help lay the foundations for peaceful, orderly development of these new countries, and that will help enhance the chances for peace for ourselves, uh, for our children, and for generations to come. Well, it seems to me that this all sounds very, very sensible. Our program, as you know, the National Farmers Organization, this is one of the <coughs> great aspects of it, as it was set up, uh, a surplus disposal system. And uh, it's always uh, seemed to us, <coughs> at least, that uh, if we could get the surplus uh, commodities into the hands of those who really needed it. And uh, this would uh, do so much to strengthen the uh, economy of agriculture and society of our country and probably do more to feed the undernourished not only in this country but throughout the whole world. And, and a, few, a few years ago, if I can just break in there, the uh, dean of the University of Georgia came up to talk to me, a uh, very able man, and uh, he said that uh, as a lifelong resident of the South, and we know that there's a great deal of, of poverty in the South, I suppose it's the poorest uh, section of the nation. One of the reasons is that it's largely an agricultural sector of our country, and agriculture is in trouble everywhere. He said that the federal school lunch program had done more 
to advance the economic and social development of the South than any other single federal program. Well, that startled me. I said, well, Dean, I don't understand how uh, feeding children uh, can make that major contribution to economic and social development. He said, I'll tell you why. That prior to the introduction of the school lunch program, there were millions of young people in the South suffering from hunger and malnutrition. He said they, it, it hurt them in their studies. They were poor students. They were not productive people. They were not good workers. They were not energetic businessmen. They were not effective and efficient farmers. And he said, when we introduce good food into the diets of those young people, we began to produce a healthier generation of people in the South with more energy, with more initiative. And he said, those are the people that have made this part of the country more creative than it otherwise would be. They've made our agriculture more productive. They've made our uh, businessmen more uh, energetic and more effective. They've made our schools more efficient and more uh, effective than they've been in the past. And I think we, if we just stop and think about it, that a good diet is at the heart of much that makes for a good life. It certainly sounds reasonable. Uh, Senator, we have a minute or so left on our program. I noticed that you have a, a new book out, A Time of War or A Time of Peace, it's entitled. Would you like to use a minute to comment well, on it? Well, I would. I, I don't want to plug my own book and commercialize this, uh, this uh, program, but the, uh, the book is really basically a collection of the speeches I have made on the subject of international peace uh, during the nearly six years that I've served in the United States Senate. I wrote a book earlier uh, that some of you may be aware of called Agricultural Thought uh, in the 20th Century, which deals with the problems of agriculture. And a book even earlier than that called War Against Want, which is the story of America's Food for Peace program. And this completes a series of three books uh, dealing with the problems of uh, agriculture, the problems of human want, and the problems of war and peace. Uh, the title, A Time of War, A Time of Peace, is taken from the Bible, from Ecclesiastes, uh, from that great uh, passage which ends, A Time to Love, A Time to Hate, A Time of War, and A Time of Peace. But it's basically the things I've said in the United States Senate, the warnings I began issuing five years ago about uh, the dangerous course we were on in Vietnam, and it makes some of my suggestions for restoring us to a more peaceful world. It's been a pleasure having you on U.S. Farm Report, Senator. Thank you very much, Ken. U.S. Farm Report has featured Food for Work with Senator George McGovern from the state of South Dakota as special guest. Doing the questioning was Ken Stofferin, director of the field staff department for the National Farmers Organization. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at the same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of agricultural producers. <laughs>